I'm going to tell you about relatively recent work done in the last four or five years, most of it actually in the very recent past, last couple of years. Um, in work such as this, in systems work such as this, it's always the work of many, many people. And I've listed the papers and the co-authors. One of these co-authors, Yu Zhao, is right here, okay? So this is work which is actually built upon one of your own uh, colleagues uh, who was a visiting uh, postdoc in my research group at the time that this work was done. So if you look at the title of the talk, it has a couple of words which perhaps need a little explaining. One of them is edge computing. Just to be sure that all of us are on the same page, I'd like to take a moment to explain what I mean by edge computing. The world of the Internet of Things today looks like this. You have various kinds of sensors, like video cameras. Um, you have uh, uh, various kinds of head-mounted displays, drones, um, IoT sensors in the home, all of these things. And they transmit the data that they collect to the cloud, OK, over here. And this is the model that is the dominant model today, 2018. Edge computing introduces a new tier, which is physically close, typically, but certainly electrically close, very high bandwidth and low latency communication. This is the critical requirement. So there is compute here which is substantial cloud-like computation, available very, very close electrically to the kinds of devices that I mentioned in the previous slide. And it turns out that the presence of this tier of computing has enormous opportunities that are made possible, okay? I don't have time in this talk to go through the full range of possibilities, okay? What I'm going to do is to shine the light on just one narrow sliver of the kind of things that are made possible by edge computing. Now, throughout my talk, I'm going to use the phrase cloudlet. Whoops, come back. I'm going to use this phrase cloudlet. A cloudlet is any computing device located at tier two. The form factors may vary. For example, Ubuntu has this box called the orange box. It fits inside the roll-on suitcase that you can take on the plane. It's a small data center, okay? Um, these are traditional 19-inch racks. You can have vehicular uh, cloudlets. You can have nautical cloudlets. You can have them in aircraft. The important point is that many of the security and isolation mechanisms in the cloud are also present in the cloudlet. So multi-tenancy using virtual machines for isolation and safety. You may have an additional layer of Docker or other containers layered on top of virtual machines, but this is the basic mechanism, okay? So throughout this talk, when I use the word cloudlet, think of it as a substantial computational entity capable of uh, doing serious video analytics, uh, which is what is needed in this application. So video cameras today are everywhere. So Britain is perhaps one of the world's leading countries in terms of deployment of video cameras. It's estimated in 2013, that's five years ago, there was one camera for every 11 British people, okay? It's estimated that London alone has over 500,000 video cameras today, okay? And these are some quotes at the bottom there. In fact, that quote from the National Science Foundation, directions in wireless networking is actually quite interesting. Video cameras are so cheap, such high resolution, and so capable, that's quite easy 
to imagine GoPro-like cameras, uh, other kinds of video cameras, uh, almost ubiquitous. Here is a New York Times article from June 8th, June 9th, just a few months ago. Whenever I've shown the previous slide, until this article appeared in the New York Times, I would have to explain to people why privacy was such a concern, et cetera, et cetera. But look at this article. The most important thing about this article, in Newark, which is a city very close to New York, anyone with internet access can watch the videos in the city. So here is a live deployment in, in the United States of a pretty substantial city in which the citizens of that city found that the value of live video in terms of security, in terms of helping them with, with, with knowing about what's going on in the city overcomes whatever concerns that they may have about privacy. So this is a recurring theme with video. Uh, all of us are concerned about privacy, but in fact, the value to citizens from use of live video is very, very powerful. So <coughs> not every city is going to be as open-minded as or, or privacy uh, uh, unconcerned as Newark. Most people do care a lot about privacy and video. And so the rest of this talk is going to be about how edge computing in the form of cloudlets can help. But before we do that, let's just take a moment to understand why video is so powerful. What is it about video that makes it so powerful? First of all, unlike other kinds of sensors, I don't have to wear anything. I don't have to ask you to install an app. Right? All you have to do is to appear within the field of view of the video camera. And over time, as more sophisticated video analytics algorithms are developed, the amount of information you can extract from a video feed actually improves. And of course, video cameras improve in resolution and in many other um, aspects, including the light level at which they're able to operate effectively, right? So there are many technical improvements. Something else that's also important about video if I give you accelerometer data and tell you, tell me what you can see here, most of us can't interpret the mass of accelerometer data. I need a machine learned model, machine, trained, machine learning trained model to interpret that data and say, okay, this is the signature of a person walking upstairs. And this part of it is where he's sitting down and so on, right? So, most kinds of sensor data requires an interpretation. Video, your eyesight is all you need. Humans can directly interpret video. So for all these reasons, the concept of video as an IoT service is a very attractive concept, right? So what might you be able to do? And in fact, I claim that it's actually a monetizable monetizable concept. So companies can make money by selling the video as a service. So here's an example. In any place, a shopping mall, a store, the ability to detect uh, some kind of hazard, a banana skin, a spilled liquid, as close to the time of occurrence and notifying somebody to, to take care of this. An example of a simple public safety measure that certainly is good for people so that they don't fall, but it's also good for the store owner so that they aren't sued uh, or have to you know, deal with the insurance company. Um, <coughs> and I see sidewalk. Maybe your sidewalk has been salted, but the guys who did it missed a few spots. How would you know until somebody falls and breaks their leg? On the other hand, if the video feed shows people slipping and sliding, you can catch this in time before the accident happens. Where is the best place to install the next set of traffic lights? It is at the intersection, but there are a large number of near misses. 
How many people report near misses? You only report the accidents that actually happened. You can analyze the video to discover the near misses and identify the places where, if you have limited resources, which are the most effective places to, to deploy them. Um, if you are a marketing company and you have just installed on behalf of this store this beautiful window display at high cost, video can tell you nobody's looking at it, nobody's pausing. You know, you may have come up with a great marketing plan, but in the real world, that is not working. So the ability to collect validating evidence in real time on many, many, many questions that are important in business, important in public safety, um, and so on, is, is extremely important. And of course, things like a missing child. I don't know if you have a service like this in Finland, but in the United States, there's something called Amber Alert, where all, every person with a cell phone gets an Amber Alert, giving the description of the child, if a photograph is available, the photograph of the child, and you are asked, if you see this child, please uh, send a text or call us and we'll come try to find the child. So typically this happens when a child is abducted. Very often it's a divorced parent or something like that. But whatever the reason, this is, this is important. Using video cameras and downloading face recognition for the child is now deploying a huge number of eyes on your behalf to look out for the child. So I'm sure that each of you can think of many, many other examples, but two things to keep in mind. Sending all video from cameras to the cloud is simply not scalable, okay? Netflix estimates that the highly optimized video streams, remember, this is movies, they can do offline optimization of the video stream. They can spend hours doing this because they only have to do it once and then it's being reused by many people many times, right? So theirs is about the most optimized you can get. It's about seven megabits per stream. So if I have a city like London with half a million video cameras, the notion of shipping all that data to the cloud is just a non-starter. And there's just not enough ingress bandwidth into the city. And remember, these cameras are always on, all right? There's no nighttime when you can buffer the stuff and ship it off later. This is continuous, 24 by seven. So the only solution that I see is to use edge computing. Don't ship the data to the cloud. Do the processing, the video analytics, at the edge, very close to the point of capture. Now, you only have to report details such as the number of people or the identification of the people who are in the video or uh, some other details. But these are five, six, seven orders of magnitude smaller in size than full video. So that is a kind of compression that no clever video optimization technique is ever going to be able to achieve, that you're going to be able to um, do the processing and reduce the size of the data dramatically, okay? <clears throat> so the world that I see looks like this. You have cloudlets down here, and associated with each cloudlet might be a large number of cameras, maybe 100 cameras. The video from those cameras by the way, some of these might be on drones, some of these might be on vehicles, the cloudlet might be inside the automobile, right? So all of these fit within the world that I'm talking about. The extracted information, the metadata that you capture from it, is shipped to the cloud. This might be, instead of being seven megabits per second per video stream, it might be as low as a few kilobits per stream. So three to four orders of magnitude smaller in terms of size. So if somebody wants to find something, let's say this is an insurance adjuster. Some guy has reported, well, I was at lunch, I parked my car, and 
somebody hit me. That's why I have a dent. I wish to file a claim. The question is, is this guy telling the truth? Maybe if I find a picture of his car perfectly intact five hours later, that's proof this guy was lying. Insurance fraud is big. You and I pay for it in the form of a higher insurance premium. So it's an example of just one of many social and societal uh, um, situations where better enforcement can have tremendous value to good citizens. Obviously, the trade-off is there's danger for abuse from privacy, which is what the rest of the talk is about. Okay? So the way this person would search for this hypothetical red car, looking for, for, for whether there's any examples of it um, uh, later in the day, you go to the cloud, you find possibly uh, using metadata such as time of day, date, et cetera, and also keywords, which are extracted by the ongoing video analytics, which are the cloudlets, and within those cloudlets, which video segments should I look at? So it has narrowed the search space dramatically. And that is the search that this person has to conduct. Now I'm going to come back to this point at the very end of the talk, okay? But for now, this is a good starting point for the kind of model that we're talking about. So I think you'll all agree at this point that while I've given you many, many good reasons why live video on behalf of citizens is valuable, we all agree there's ample opportunity for misuse. And so somehow you want to strike a balance. And my fundamental hypothesis is that this balance has to be decided by each local community based on its customs, local mores, and so on. That there isn't a single uh, universal set of privacy policies that is going to work. So let me give you some hypothetical examples. So I work for a university, Carnegie Mellon University. I could imagine that the university administration says, okay, here are the rules. We are going to deploy video cameras extensively on campus. During working hours, any employee of the university, if his face is visible in a video camera, that should be left unmasked. In other words, during working hours, if you're visible, the value to your colleagues, to your students, to knowing where you are and visible is more than any loss of privacy you might have. So um, that's what we do. On the other hand, if you're not an employee of the university, if you're a student or a visitor, then the default should be you are opted out so that you have your face blanked out in the video, in the live video. That, that's an example. A different enterprise, a different community might have different set of rules. The important point is in real time, somehow, on live video, you have to be able to enforce these kinds of policies. And that enforcement is really the subject of this talk. How to do it and how to do it with sufficient performance. Okay? It's well known in security that there's a close relationship between policy and mechanism. Okay? Great policies are useless if you don't have the mechanisms to enforce them. On the other hand, policies, you, can even, you can't even articulate policies if your mechanisms do not have a way to express them. So these go hand in hand, and so what I'm going to give you is a range of policies that are possible today using what we have implemented, and you can ask if you wanted a richer set of policies, what mechanisms should we add, what would it demand in terms of computation at the edge, and so on. So denaturing is the term that I use to indicate modification of the content of the video to make it safe for public release. So the term, of course, comes from denatured alcohol, where you take ethanol 
and you add a little bit of poisonous methanol to it, and then it's free to put it on the drugstore shelf. The assumption is that you're not stupid enough to drink it. Okay? You go blind or die. So denatured alcohol is you know, say an example of, of how you're taking a product that is inherently um, bad and, and making it safe for public widespread dissemination. So this is the concept in, in video. What do we have to do? So here's an example where the first one says, mask all faces that you see. You know that there's a man and a woman in front of the Eiffel Tower, but you don't know who they are. I think most people would say, this is probably okay, you know, in terms of denaturing. This one goes one step further. It has even removed the Eiffel Tower, right? Because it's a well-known landmark. So if there is some reason for you to believe that you should hide even uh, uh, location information, this is an example of how you might do it. This one says there are certain people whose faces don't deserve to be obscured, like the guy on the left. I won't say more. Um, <coughs> the person on the right, however, we, we blurred their face. So you have to be able to do face recognition in real time in order to be able to do this, okay? So there's a trade-off here. The original video has the highest value in terms of all those uh, examples I gave you in the beginning of the talk, but it's also the most privacy revealing. If you're really, really terrified about privacy, just black out the entire frame, okay? Your guaranteed perfect privacy, but it's totally useless video. So the key point is to recognize that performing these transformations guided in real time by a policy specification is really the technical challenge that you somehow have to, have to master. Notice that these are examples of looking at an individual video frame a single frame. You can do the, all of those by working on a single frame. You can imagine more sophisticated policies such as the following. If there's a video sequence with people shaking hands, that's okay. You don't have to blur, mask that. But if they're doing something intimate, you should mask that out. Activity recognition to actually understand intimate behavior and then mask it out is actually a difficult technical challenge. Uh, expressing it and deciding whether something is intimate or not is hard. Doing it in real time is even harder, right? So you can see the depth of complexity that um, you can get to take, this, to take these ideas further, okay? But for today's talk, I'm going to take this level of security, selective face obscuring, as a level of sophistication that we're trying to achieve, okay? So we have created a face recognition system called Open Face. This is available in GitHub, and it's completely open source. It's widely used today. And it's inspired by work done at both Facebook and Google just in the last three years. So it turns out Facebook has the largest collection of labeled images in the world, right? They have your pictures, they have your identification, they have I don't know how many hundred million users. So it's a proprietary data set and they published a paper called Deepface in 2014, who's, where they showed the accuracy of the face recognition equal to human accuracy, okay? And not to be outdone, Google, which also has a very large collection of tagged information from their users, um, the next year published FaceNet, which is based on their image collection. Now, DeepFace and FaceNet are not open source. You cannot run them. 
If when you go to Facebook or when you go to Google, in their services, you are being, you are using these. Okay? So when you upload a photograph and the system automatically tags the name of the person, these are the algorithms that are being used in order to achieve it. But it's not available for general purpose use. So our goal was to create an open source implementation using publicly available labeled face data. And so the largest such data, data set is only about half a million images. So our accuracy, which is very good as I will show you in the next slide, is limited by this fact that the machine learning with additional training data on the order of tens of millions, which is what Google and Facebook have, would certainly be better. So here's the accuracy. So all of you who are familiar with the ROC curves, there's an ROC curve. Uh, for those of you who are not, the way to think of this is that perfect accuracy would be a step function. Okay, right at the top, and horizontal. A totally useless detector or classifier would be a line at 45 degrees. That's like random guessing. So the closer you're able to get to a step function, the more
have the ability to do it, so I think it's important in, in, in a complex service. So, so the encrypted bits are saved inside the virtual machine, and the encryption key is changed periodically. Once the encryption key is changed, these bits can only be decrypted if you get back the key that was used at that time. Okay? I'll say more about this in a few seconds. So the bottom line is inside this virtual machine, the worst that can happen, a compromise, you go attack the cloudlet, gain physical control of it, the most recent images, these are the most recent encryption key, those are the only ones all the ones you have, to, to the extent that your encryption algorithm is resistant to attack, those are also resistant. So once you have the nature this data, you are now able to run, present it to multiple analytics algorithms. And if you are a company that's the point of infrastructure, you charge premium both for the cycles and, of course, for the video feed. See why this is very, very interesting. You can also archive the Dinage video for a long time to come. This is something important. An hour of HD video consumes three gigabytes. That means a one terabyte disk, which is only $100 on Amazon, can hold 50 days worth of continuous data from it. So any cloudlet with a reasonable amount of storage can have easily a week's or multiple weeks worth of data, even if it's handling the open streams. So <clears throat> how do you do the denaturing faster? The easy way, so what all of us would do, uh, is you take the frame, you detect faces, and then on each face, you recognize the face. And then you consult the policy that says, whose faces can I leave uh, unmasked? And whose faces should I mask? And then you do that, and what comes out is denature. Easy, pretty grand and simple, could be an undergraduate programming exercise. Unfortunately, that pipeline is too small. Here's why. Once you have detected faces, you can recognize them in part at multiple cores. Okay? But face detection, unfortunately, has been incredibly resistant to parallelization. Using a GPU doesn't help. It is possible to use specialized hardware, which is why some high-end cameras actually have the ability in real time detect the faces, in fact, to detect a smile, and to take a picture with the smiles on the wings. But that's using very specialized hardware. On the general purpose machine, of the class we're talking about here, 4 core i7, which is a pretty fast machine, you can use as a cloud, it takes almost 130 milliseconds per frame. And then to do face recognition, if you do so many cores, could recognize all of them in parallel, you can still take another 60 milliseconds. So 180 milliseconds is what it takes per frame. To do this at 30 frames a second, I have to do this all in 33 milliseconds. That's the budget that I So clearly, this is simply not going to work. So the critical insight is to recognize that even the most athletic human being does not shift dramatically between frames. Okay? But there's temporal locality across frames. And therefore, once I find a face in one frame, tracking it is a much faster, much simpler problem. So this leads to the following more sophisticated approach where Here's the input video screen. The frame, you don't do any face detection. You don't
remember any face recognition, would you know where the faces were and who they were in the previous frame? Okay? Do you remember that? All you do is you do face tracking. Oops, so that. Face tracking to identify the new positions of the same faces. Now, here's the problem. This technique is not perfect. The reason it's not perfect is think of when somebody opens the door and comes in. There is a first frame in which that person's face is present. It wasn't present in the previous frame. So this would not catch them. So what we do is we don't release that frame immediately, we hold it in the buffer. We sample the incoming video frames at low frame rate. And we do the full algorithm, the face protection and the recognition. And then we check to see whether we missed any faces on this frame. Okay? The reason you can do it is because even though this path took much longer, the frame that came on from here is being held in here for a certain delay period. If the frame indicates that you missed some faces, we reverse track those faces to the previous frames. Occasionally, this leads to errors, meaning you black out a portion of the image, but there really was no face. But that's okay, that's benign. Right? You, want, you don't have a privacy need. What you have is a, just an example of losing a small bit of information that you didn't need to have So this approach actually works beautifully on the same hardware that any acceleration is able to deliver over 30 frames a second, which is what you need for. If you need a high frame rate, 60 frames a second, you need correspondingly faster uh, core mechanisms. The idea can still be applied to achieve this. Okay? So how long does this frame revisit buffer have to be? In our measurements of this kind of system, buffering roughly 30 frames handles 99.9% of the privacy. So that means that one second delay what you need in the removal process, which is very, very close to real time for all of our operations. Okay? <clears throat> now, the scalability of this approach is also excellent. So, as you increase the number of video frames, if I have two video frames on the system, so, sorry. Okay. Um, you can see here, as the number of video streams is increased from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16, you do lose the maximum frame rate at which you are able to keep. Okay. The alternative approach is to say downsampling. Really, don't even come in very close. So, as a general, as a general scalable approach to real-time phase denaturing, this works pretty well. Okay, so let's come back to the question of reverse denaturing. This happens in the real world. Many of you are, I'm sure, aware of the horrible bombing of the Boston Marathon in 2013. The perpetrators were caught by carefully examining video from stores, store cameras which had videos. Uh, this is one of those. And in fact, you can see the guy's face there. Now, if you had been using a system such as one I'm describing here, all these faces would have been blacked up. So, you know, uh, five days after the bombing or three days after the bombing, how do I come back and unblur the faces? Right? And you want to do this in a very careful way so that it's not abused. So the approach is the following. Remember the privacy mediator VM that I mentioned to you. We assume that there's some external trusted authority, okay? This might be uh, a server located in a very secure place 
whose job it is to randomly generate the encryption keys that are used to encrypt the obscured bits and saved in here. So there's some periodic interval, say every few hours. You can shorten this, you can lengthen this. This is a policy choice. Let's say every hour, the privacy mediator VM goes to the trusted external authority and says, please give me a new key. And the trusted external authority says, on this date, on this time, on behalf of this virtual machine, here's the privacy key that I generated. And it logs this internally. So it keeps the key in escrow in perpetuity. So the keys in here are changed every hour. And maybe a day or two days or three days later, a request comes saying, I've gone to the judge. I've convinced the judge that this is a legitimate public safety request. Between time X and time Y from the following video cameras, I have been given permission to remove, reverse the denaturing of the faces. So basically that request has to be suitably validated. And now what the trusted external authority does is it hands over the keys that it had escrowed from that period of time. And using that, this virtual machine can combine the archived denatured video, which is blackened faces, with the decrypted bits from here and recombine them to give you back the original image. And this, you can do this as a post facto operation. Okay? So, <coughs> I've given you the simple cases. In practice, imagine an exercise like, uh, I lost my dog. I think it's wandering about somewhere in the city. Please help me find it. Face recognition is hard enough, and Facebook has tens of millions of labeled faces. The chances that my dog has you know, that many labeled face images, or your dog has, you know, these kinds of things are very hard. That what you're looking for in general, in, in reality, may not always be uh, anticipated. What, what you're looking for now may not have been anticipated in the video analytics that is regularly run on the captured video. So there is a need to not only index the video using algorithms, this you can do on an ongoing basis, and the particular set of algorithms that is in that paper that I mentioned dates from Microsoft. We have also used deep neural networks. There are many algorithms you can use for the indexing part. The much more interesting part is if the user who's doing the search has information that is fresh, that was not part of the original indexing, how do I factor that into a search? So this is ongoing work. We think of it as the last mile of the search. And <coughs> the, the numbers in the dog search, for example, are quite daunting. You know, for example, if you have Manhattan, and about half the size of Manhattan is about 12 square miles. If you had 100,000 surveillance cameras, that's about 800 million frames in 24 hours. There's no way anybody's going to look through them. Even if you sample them once every 10 seconds, and you said, while I didn't search for your dog, dog detection is certainly capable of part of the standard suite of analytics, right? So, even if I had only a 0.1% hit rate, that brings it down to 800,000 frames. That's a lot for a single individual who's the only person who knows what her dog looks like. That's my dog. Can I find it in any video? So where we are today in our work is the creation of tools to interactively search this kind of, of data, okay? We have a number of ideas and a number of proofs of concept uh, that I'll be happy to talk about offline with any of you. So, I want to go back to the start of our discussion, which had to do with edge computing and video. Video is only one example of an IoT device. 
right, video camera. There are many other IoT devices. My belief is the bandwidth and processing demands of video are so high that if you're able to deal with video, nothing else will scare you. Okay, that the data rates and the bandwidth demands and the processing demands of almost all other sensors that I can think of are lower than that of video. So what we have shown as a proof of concept is very high confidence that this general approach of real-time processing of sensor data at the edge to enforce privacy policies is in fact quite viable. The reason this is important is the following. I think all of you will agree, just looking at the business investments I've listed here, that IoT is big, okay? Um, Google purchased Nest. That's an obscene amount of money, $2.4 billion, okay? Um, uh, Intel created a business unit devoted to IoT. Um, the estimate is that by 2020, which is not that far away, two years from now, okay, the IoT market is going to be 8.9 trillion T dollars. For comparison, the G20 economy, the ent entire economy in 2013 was only half of that, $4 trillion. So these, num these, these are all projections. Even if they're off by a factor of two, or even if they're off by a factor of three, the numbers are still scary large, okay? So <coughs> it's very interesting to note that industrial applications of IoT, no problem. They're happening, they're happening very well, and they're going to continue. But the <coughs> projected adoption in homes by people has slowed down. Okay, I have a number of quotes here, which you can read for yourself, that, that are from the past year, two years, that all suggest that the public, you know, the public is not stupid. They may not quite understand denaturing, they may not quite understand exactly how uh, IoT sensors combined with machine learning can reveal data about themselves that they could never have wanted to reveal. But there are enough anecdotal stories that's causing huge concern, right? Imagine you install a water, a nest water sensor, which sends water volume readings to nest every minute. Right? This is doable. The reason you do this is so that nest can detect water leaks in your home and tell you that compared to your neighbors, you seem to be using 30% more water. We think this is because you have a water leak in your home, right? So there are good reasons to do this kind of thing. But on the other hand, what's also possible is for somebody at Nest to run machine learning and say, hey, looks like your commode was flushed 10 times this morning. Somebody in your family has diarrhea. Why should somebody in the cloud know about my family circumstances? or the electricity meter, which reports uh, readings every minute or so. You can, you can analyze this and come to the conclusion, looks like you had an overnight visitor last night. What business is it of some cloud entity to make these kinds of inferences about me? So, while people don't quite know how it is done, they are on to the fact that unconstrained transmission of sensor data from their private homes to cloud entities with no constraints whatsoever is not something they want to do. So this brings us to a very interesting observation. So some of you may have read this book written a long time ago called Crossing the Chasm. It's widely known about the diffusion of new technologies into the public. How many of you have read this book? Two, three, four. Okay, there seem to be enough people. Let me just very crisply summarize at the risk of doing grave injustice to a long book in, in one minute what the book says. 
basically, the book divides the general population into these uh, five categories. Innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, laggards. Okay? It's basically their resistance to adopting or their eagerness with which they adopt new technologies. So laggards, these are the people who recently switched to touchstone phones because rotary phones are no longer supported. Okay? If it had been possible to continue using the old circular rotary phones, they would have continued to use them. So until they are forced to change, the laggards aren't going to change. Okay? The early innovators, for example, are the guys who line up outside the Apple store the night before. Right? Because there's a new iPhone coming out tomorrow. These guys you know, are interested in, in novelty for novelty's sake. They're the first ones to buy something new on the block and use it. So early adopters are kind of the next, slightly less enthusiastic, but of the same genre. So the critical message of the book is that for any new cool technology, okay, it is very easy to get up to here, to get the innovators and early adopters to have market penetration. Okay? But your innovation is going to fail unless it reaches the tipping point. And you won't reach the tipping point until you can convince the early majority. You have to get there. And the central message of the book, which is why it's called Crossing the Chasm, is that between these two groups and the early majority is a huge, scary chasm. Understanding for your technology what the chasm is and then figuring out how to overcome it is key. So the message from this is for IoT, the chasm is a chasm of privacy and trust. That adoption in personal lives is never going to cross this chasm until the public, the early majority, is convinced that it has a handle on the privacy problem. And <laughs> the key design principle that emerges from all that I've described to you in my talk so far is the ability of users to control the release of the information is crucial. Okay? So it's my face or my child's face and my ability to control when and under what circumstances it's released is a key. Um, if a video camera is pointing at my backyard, I want to selectively filter what I'm willing to share with Nest. Okay? Why would I ever share anything with Nest? Presumably, Nest gives me some benefit. Presumably, there's some value that it delivers to me, which is why I'm willing to release it. But I need the ability to control it. And I hope I've convinced you that an approach that is viable is for a edge-based infrastructure in the form of a cloudlet to perform in real time transformation of the data, denaturing, to meet any desired policy specification. And that it is also possible to store the unreleased data locally for a significant period of time in case there's a good reason to come back and revisit what was skipped. They have to still have to convince you that you should re reveal it to them, but you're in charge. It's not automatically being transmitted to the, to the uh, cloud. Okay? So in general, this notion, this model of privacy mediation is something that edge computing gives you, and it's one of the unique attributes even for high data rate sensors. So I hope in this talk, I've given you some insight into why edge computing is very exciting. This is only one out of many reasons why it is exciting. And as I said, uh, many of the other reasons are equally exciting. Thank you.
than we do. Uh, uh, very interesting talk, thank you. Uh, I was wondering about the energy cost of the of the system of doing it on a cloud or doing it on the edge. So there's now two com combinations of the data where uh, what is the energy cost of actually transferring the data up to the cloud and then doing the inference there, or what is the cost of energy to actually doing the computation massively in a massive parallel way as what you are actually suggesting here in the system? That's a very interesting question. I don't think this is a situation where there's any economy of scale. Google cannot do it cheaper energy-wise than you can do it in the cloudlets. That said, let me offer you the arguments for why doing it at the edge might actually be better. A Google data center, or any data center for that matter, um, is, a, is a very compute intensive environment. Things like thermal efficiency, um, the cost of cooling in that environment is expensive. The edge might be your basement. You know, for the smaller density of compute in a smaller edge location, the marginal economy of cooling might actually be better because you're not concentrating the heat from denaturing, you know, I don't know, a million video cameras in one data center and then trying to cool it. By design, I'm dispersing it. By construction, I'm dispersing it. So yes. I would argue yes, there that if even... there is a trade-off to be made, it's in favor of edge computing, though There's I've never made the case. There's actually an argument that is even more trade, kind of, a, kind of a, on, on behalf of your argumentation, is that in countries like Finland, you can actually use it for heating. And there are some of these uh, kind of a startups that are having these kind of edge computers on, on as connected to their, to their radiators. <laughs> <that> actually <laughs> I have, hadn't thought of it, but now that you mention it, one can make that argument, indeed. Thank you. Yes. Julio is getting a workout. Thank you. Uh, great talk. Uh, uh, I would like to discuss about this application deployment on the edge. I mean, like uh, we have the option, of course, to deploy closer to the cost, uh, to the users, but we still are dependent on the software developers to make, uh, how can I say, uh, compatible applications that work in the edge. For example, we have many, I think most of the web applications use like a security endpoint like SSL. So in that sense, uh, I, I don't know how we could uh, deploy those kind of applications closer because they need to be in the cloud or Okay, excellent point. So the question is, you're asking, is it possible to take an application that runs in the cloud today and just move it to the edge? Yes. Okay, that's an easy way to ask the question. Notice, I never made that claim about this class of applications. This uh, class of applications is born at the edge, right? You don't do denaturing in the cloud today. You don't even try doing it, right? So um, your point is well taken that if you're trying to make the case that there is no application modification needed, you can just move applications from the cloud to the edge, that's simply not true. And you gave a good example. If I'm using end-to-end -end encryption, then my security endpoint now has to be the edge node. It has to be the cloudlet. Okay? I have to move the service, including the ability to decrypt end-to-end, at the edge, and then I can do it. Okay, so in that sense, are, will, are we still uh, dependent on those software providers in order to make that kind of application edge? Uh, uh, so the question is, are we still stuck with Facebook and Google and all the others, and do they have to buy into edge computing before this will happen? For those uh, centers, of course. Right, so, so here's a question, right? I mean, you can look upon it as the heavy weight of legacy, or you can look upon it as an opportunity. The, the younger, fleeter-footed startups can offer services at the edge with the big fat guys can't do because they're too lazy. 
It's, it's, it, you, can, you can look at it both ways. If, I, if I'm able to offer you agility and nimbleness and the ability to download new algorithms, analyze things faster uh, with a shorter uh, deadline to get answers back in real time, things of that kind. And if that's what I'm, a company is able to offer you, that's in some cases, if you pick the use cases correctly, that's high value. Okay. Right? So I think edge computing, I think, will, will succeed not by blindly making cloud-based applications somehow better, okay? I think unique new applications that couldn't be done in the cloud, and I gave you, this is an example, right? There's no hope of shipping all the data to the cloud. You have to do it at the edge. Okay. Great. Thank you, Satya. Here we have one question then. Uh, hello, yes, uh, um, uh, my question is regarding the uh, privacy mediators. So you said that uh, the privacy mediators, they are like uh, regulating the information that the users are exposing, I mean the sensor data, right? But who is, who is uh, like regulating the privacy mediators then? Excellent question. So who is, who is minding the minder, right? So this is a very good question. So let me tell you, this, this is a world not yet created. Right? Let me give you the answer that I think is the answer that people will feel comfortable with. Let's say, let's just as an example pick Nest, because they make sensors. Today many IoT sensors send the data to Nest in the cloud. Nest is owned by Google. I have a cloudlet in my house. Let's say it's provided by Verizon, which is a phone company. What's a phone company in Finland? Is it Vodafone? Um, whatever is a phone company here it might be one of them. Hmm? All right, so, 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 so some, let's say they provide, right? It's a, it's a party that is a neutral party. Now the question is, who is running the mediator software on it that checks, say, the video? I certainly don't want it to be Nest, right? Because those guys have vested interest in not doing it right. Maybe Microsoft, which is not a party in this chain, makes this. Maybe Verizon licenses it from them. And they tell me, for your video data, we offer you Microsoft certified denaturing software. So that would be the way it would work. There needs to be a business model in which a third party, which is not aligned with the endpoint, makes the mediator, right? That's the only way in which I think the average person will trust that software. If it is, if there's free mediator software provided by Nest, you know, maybe some people will accept it. I think many people may decide not to. I think it's an interesting question. What user behavior will be? How much will it have to cost before a user says, the free mediator from Nest is good enough. These are business questions for which I don't know the answers. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is majorly uh, coming from the point of view of a shift from a traditional cloud computing to an edge computing era. Uh, the one good thing about centralized data centers is that now you have these public uh, data center providers uh, which have made it open to any kind of application developers, irrespective of the use case, to upload their applications and get it up and working. Yep. Uh, but when, whenever we were talking about the edge, we always assume that the edge is there, and we are just talking about how are we going to utilize the edge. My question comes in the point of view of the management and the establishment of these edge resources, and who will be responsible for deploying it, and then how do you use these resources? Okay, so that's many questions, not one. Yeah, so. Okay, so let me try to answer parts of these. Okay, I may not answer all of them. Okay. okay. So first of all, look at this picture. This is the picture I showed you. Yeah. This is a cloudlet, this is, think of this. So think of what you do today with Amazon in cloud computing. Amazon gives you a virtual machine. 
What you do in the privacy of your virtual machine is your business, okay? If you do something bad and you chew, go into a tight loop chewing huge amounts of cycles, does Amazon care? You just get a bigger bill, all right? Um, if you send out a flood of packets, does Amazon care? At some point they may throttle you, but you get charged by the packets. So in some sense, billing addresses malfeasance. okay? It's one part of the story. However, an, virtual machines do provide isolation. So there is a pretty hefty, thick wall between you and your neighbor who's running on the same AWS machine. Notice that every single thing I've said about AWS up to now applies here on this cloud. So notice these three analytics algorithms here. One, two, three. These could be three competitors from the same live video feed of Times Square. Okay? This is clothing company X or marketing company working on behalf of clothing company X. This is another marketing company working on behalf of clothing company Y and Z. And they're all studying what's happening in Market Square to give useful information to the guys who are paying them. All right? The unique resource, first of all, remember from a business point of view, I don't offer the live video feed of Times Square anywhere else except on this cloudlet. And I charge a lot more on this cloudlet than AWS does for the same cycles. It's premium value because I'm giving you a unique attribute you can't get anywhere else. So my point is the mechanisms of cloud computing have thought long and hard about your question. There's a good reason I called my nodes cloudlets. They're smaller, but in terms of isolation and safety, they use the same technology as the cloud for precisely the reasons those mechanisms work well. Uh, so, uh, so now come to the question of who manages this. Yeah, exactly. Okay, what does AWS have to do to manage their cloud? They don't have to inspect software from users. They let you run whatever you want in their VMs. So as far as management of this cloudlet is concerned, as long as my underlying hypervisor is intact and the physical security of this cloudlet is intact, all of the rest follows by construction. So the main source of administrative challenge for, say, Verizon or Vodafone or whoever else is going to deploy these cloudlets, it, you know, it might be Google, it might be Akamai, right? I don't care who deploys them. Somebody is deploying them, making money from the deployment. The main headaches for them are to recognize that the cost of management of dispersed infrastructure is always going to be higher than centralized infrastructure, right? This is the economies of scale of centralized. There's a whole reason cloud computing succeeded, right? So no question, you have to accept that. So somehow your cost per compute unit at the edge, at the end of the day, will have to reflect that. Your business model has to reflect that, okay? Second, you are going to have to pay attention to physical security. There's work done, you know, 20, 30, maybe 20 years ago. There's a lot of focus on tamper evidence, tamper resistance, various kinds of hardware, software combinations, dealing with attestations of various kinds, right? I think a lot of those ideas have applicability here. For a little while, the cloud made these pieces of work less relevant, right? When I have a fortress called a data center, right? I have such superb perimeter protection, I don't have to worry about what's inside. Here, these guys are in much more vulnerable locations. They're in Starbucks. They're in your car, okay? So approaches such as having a tamper detecting enclosure and it gives you X seconds of lead time when somebody tries to cut the enclosure and break it. And you have that much lead time to destroy any secrets inside. So you need, you know, the design, this is an opportunity for the Dells and the Lenovo's 
of the world to build cloudlets that can be physically deployed in edge locations. So think of it as an opportunity that, that is a business opportunity for these guys.